Wuthering Heights. Just the name of this classic novel is enough to conjure up images in most people's minds. What that image may be for you may vary. For some, it may be the misty metaphors on the Yorkshire Moor setting. For others, it may be a wailing woman, wide-eyed and wearing white. For others still, it may be of a, a young, long-haired, extraordinarily hot Tom Hardy, lying in bed, waiting for whatever. Whatever your perspective, it does highlight the fact that Wuthering Heights has permeated society, no matter what your literary prowess may be. In fact, you probably know more about the story than you first think. Despite its popularity today, when it was first published in 1847, the reception to the only novel by Emily Bronte, or Ellis Bell, was somewhat tepid. There are several hypotheses for this, which are well worth a Google of your time. Before the decade was done, however, Emily, her brother, and her three of her sisters had all died. As the only Bronte sibling still remaining, one can imagine that poor Charlotte wanted to stay busy and alive. Perhaps this is why, well, along with her smoking hot reputation post Jane Eyre, it led her to correcting the typos, the grammar and apparently some plot holes in the original version to publish a second edition in 1850. Either way, the second chance certainly helped the memory of Emily. By the turn of the century, the fickle finger of fortune had turned Emily's way. Opinions had changed and Wuthering Heights became, and remains, widely regarded as being the best of all the Bronte sisters' novels, including Jane Eyre. Ha, screw you, Charlie B as Emily may have been thinking from beyond the grave. Even with the book's rising popularity, the complexity of the plot, with its interwoven, interfamilial relationships and excessive death toll, all seemed to make it far too bothersome to adapt. But that didn't stop many people trying many, many people. Director Emma Rice has made her new adaptation of the 19th century classic a rare example of a production that is easy, accessible and can be enjoyed by everyone equally. But a quick recce counts at least 24 films, 8 television series, 3 operas, 4 plays, 2 musicals, the novel or its characters at least are referenced in 27 literary works, 16 recorded songs, 30 TV shows, three artworks, some movies, and the computer game Minecraft. Johnny Depp said it taught him about romance. Gordon Brown famously compared himself to the anti-hero Heathcliff. This amounts to over 120 references made in popular media over the years, which sort of begs the question, why, Emma? Why do we need another? But another we have, and there's no use crying over spilt moors. There's also no value in me explaining the plot here. But if we are to evaluate the production, we do need to look at its heart. Though it's often called a love story, it would be more accurate to say that Wuthering Heights is a story about love. Not love as in longed for romance and flowers, more lust as all-consuming vengeance and anger. The Far From Love Bird in this Far From Love story would be fodder for newspaper headlines today. Uh, Tabloids would call them Crazy Cathy, Hunky Heathcliff. But it is clear more, much more lies behind them than just the headlines. They are both addicts. They both reject authority and rebel against societal norms. Both defensively reject affection but demand attention. They strive to fit in whilst fighting to stand out. As infants, Heathcliff and Catherine are played in this production by puppets when they first meet. 
Catherine's father, Mr Earnshaw, finds puppet Heathcliff at Liverpool docks and, of course, as a good Christian would, adopts him into his home. When Ash Hunter takes the role from the puppet, puts the poor puppet out of work, he gives his most rounded performance as Heathcliff. He carries himself as a child as though wrapping the burden of his secret scars in the blanket of childhood dreams. Hunter seems to become the older, embittered Heathcliff, moneyed, cynical, angry, with little more than a change of costume. We know this change happens, but it might just have happened elsewhere from what we're watching. To be fair, Hunter gives a strong, very metered performance, with the requisite broodiness and moodiness. It is much as we might expect from a Heathcliff. It is little more. Lucy McCormick's Catherine makes her mark on stage as she first appears screaming the place down. From there, she just goes upwards. Her energy is a ball of fire that refuses to go out no matter what's going on around her. She sparks flames wherever she treads. Her Catherine is rarely likeable. Depending on your viewpoint, she may be highly strung, she may be a sport brat, she may have ADHD. But she has an energy, and even when she's on stage, just watching you can feel her presence. And McCormick seems to be having an absolute ball. This is her bag. Using the name Lucy Muck, her website says she, quote, makes nightclub interruptions, cabaret interventions, and extravaganza theater, marrying absurdity and the grotesque. I couldn't describe her Catherine more fittingly. Energy abounds in all corners of this production, not just with McCormick. There are 12 actors who, between them, play over 20 roles, switching confidently and naturally from being the storytellers to the story's players. They move time, they change sets in front of us with, without that awful awkwardness. It may at first, first sight seem that designer Vicky the Littleton Whisperer Mortimer has provided little more here than a revolving front door and two high back chairs. But these have been made intrinsic to the flow of the action, so we never question a, a change of location or a passage of time that has just been created with the subtlest of alterations. It's a marvellous job. <music> Musicians sit upstage and underscore the action throughout the entire play. A number of times the music swells and we suddenly get a proper, full-on, original, often rock, song. Some are delivered a script using that old sing me that song you used to sing when type prompt and others are done looking in from the outside. In a particular highlight, McCormick again goes full rock chuck on us, showing off the power of her voice with a performance that is both beautiful and guttural. It ends with a, a mic drop and a blackout. Cute. It's less than a full blown musical. It's more than just some songs added to a play. It's a construct that shouldn't really work. And I can't tell you why, but it does. It really, really does. The book tells the story in flashback from the perspective of the housekeeper and Soho pub namer, Nellie Dean. Here, the role of the narrator is even more pivotal than that. They acknowledge early on in a very meta style that the plot is too confusing to understand. Not every event of the book can be played on stage, if we ever want to go home, that is, and it is down to the narrator here to fill in the gaps, to give us bullet points of what has happened that is important so that the rest of the story makes sense. The narrator dances and sings to mark weeks or years of time passing. They harmonise with each other to... Ah, uh, wait. I may have omitted an important detail. Let me just rewind a moment. Here... Nelly Dean does not appear in Rice's production. Instead, the narration is done by, how do I put this without sounding like a drama student? Forget that for a moment. Played by Nandi Bebe, whose performance mesmerises truly throughout. The narrator here is the singing, 
dancing, speaking, yeah. hat made out of branches wearing Yorkshire moor. The moor extends with up to nine other mini moors who join together in the manner of a, a Greek chorus as and when required. To be fair, everyone remembers the moor in Wuthering Heights. Now everyone who sees this will remember the moor in Wuthering Heights. Besides the personification of foliage, there are many other elements um, in Rice's production that seem inspired by Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It's mainly harmless, but there is something a bit passé in 2022 about seeing actors break out of character informally, or sitting on stools where the wings should be, or in fact there aren't any wings, seeing the, the lighting rig and the stage crew in clear view. It's not to disparage the Edinburgh Festival at all. After all, this is written for Broadway Baby. But that's all the more reason why we feel like we've seen it all before. And for somebody like Emma Rice, that doesn't seem enough. It's just a bit how to do theatre, chapter six, experimental. That said, there's a lot of fun to be had in this tragedy. Yes, the second act loses some of the polished energy of the first, but it's much shorter, and it nicely ties up all those loose ends, so it's worth coming back from the interval for. It may not be Rice at her A game, but it's far from boring. And let's face it, Rice's B game is worth seeing. Is it quite as unique as it may think? Does it really strike the balance between faithful retelling and accessible fun? I'm not sure on either point. See it without expectations. See it without questions. See it without comparisons. I know how I'm done. 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 I know how I'm done.